So thank you, Kristen, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, my talk today is going to be a little bit different from uh, the talk that was advertised. I think this is a tradition of the protest talks that uh, everyone changes their topic of their talk slightly. So um, if you're interested in uh, perhaps a talk on uh, the nuclear Anthropocene, then I recommend that you look at the Sonic Acts website. Uh, if you Google Ellie Carpenter Sonic Acts, there's a film of me giving my nuclear Anthropocene talk. So I'm not giving that talk again, I've decided. I've given it about 20 times, so I've kind of done that. Um, and there's a couple of other texts that I've written that might be of interest if you thought I was going to talk about Deleuze and Stengers and Lines of Flight, then I recommend the Power in the Land essay. And if you thought I was going to talk about um, kind of the materiality of the uninvention of nuclear weapons, then you should really read the um, essay that I wrote in the, um, what's it called, Cold War Legacies book. So all of those texts are on the link, uh, references are on the VLE. Uh, but I've decided tonight to share a very particular experience and to try and uh, start to theorise that experience in terms of my own curatorial practice. So I'm not really going to talk about the Perpetual Uncertainty exhibition or any of the artworks in it. Um, and several of the artists who are in that show are here. Uh, so I should say I'm not going to talk about your works of anyone that's here. Um, but I'm going to share with you an important part of our creative activist history, dealing with ideas of collapsing distance, direct action, and the agency of women. So to tell you this story, I have to... Oh, the sound just changed. <laughs> to tell you this story, I have to show you some footage of non-violent direct action at the Green and Women's Peace Camp in the 1980s. Then I can trace the ideas of nonviolent direct action developed at Greenham and see how they might or might not articulate contemporary artistic and curatorial practices within nuclear culture and perhaps within, within culture in general. So Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp was um, uh, established around 1981 just before the American cruise missiles, which carried nuclear warheads, were sighted at what was called RAF Greenham Common and quickly became USAF Greenham Common. So this was a kind of feeling of occupation of the American military sighting um, Cold War nuclear missiles in Berkshire. So it's an hour away from London, uh, if you travel sort of west, southwest, um, and the base is, uh, had about a 10 meter perimeter, and lots and lots of different peace camps around the perimeter of the fence. <coughs> At Greenham, the predominant uh, discourse and mode of activism was nonviolent direct action. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So I'm going to show you some short films of direct, direct action in Greenham that I hope will show you uh, where I'm coming from. I'm going to talk about two um, uh, writers, two textual references to uh, resistance and nonviolence from Howard Cagle to Anna Fagenbaum. And then I'm going to uh, try and define the characteristics of nonviolent direct action in terms of its nonviolence, its directness, and its action. Do what it says on the tin. <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to show you some artworks that perhaps um, use some of these uh, characteristics of uh, nonviolent direct action, which I'll shorten to NVDA, nonviolent direct action, uh, which is slightly problematizes my point here that nonviolence is one word when using NVDA, because then I've broken up the nonviolence into two words for a suitable acronym. But the acronym really comes from the peace camp, so that's what I'm going with. 
There are lots and lots of footnotes to this paper. So when we talk about protest, um, there's a huge difference between protest, action, activism, non-violence, action, direct action, uh, civil disobedience, for example. And maybe that discussion is a, a kind of separate paper because what I'm going to focus on today is a very specific approach to non-violent direct action that sometimes encompasses uh, civil disobedience, uh, sometimes takes place within wider forms of protest, um, and is always an action, but it is always a non-violent and a direct action. It's not misdirected, undirected, or remotely directed action. So I'm very interested in the kind of material and locatedness of this um, kind of agency. So hundreds of thousands of women from all over the world came to Greenham over about 10 years. And when there were actions taking place, when there was a particular kind of demonstration, and it was called an action, not a demonstration, and I hope that would become clear why throughout my talk, um, people would, women would um, encircle the base. So let's see if all my links work. A few years ago, The Guardian um, compiled this website, and it's probably the most comprehensive and articulate online uh, archive of Green Common. And you can see the URL here, and I'll show you a little bit about how that works. And I'm just going to show you the introductory film and then the blockade film, as I think that introduces the camp uh, very clearly. What is this in aid of? Is this to prevent us getting in or you lot getting out? <laughs> missiles and they were talking about obstruction of highway. <laughs> it's illogical. You can't even have an adult conversation with them on a, a serious issue of that nature. What can you realistically do unarmed and in a non-violent manner against um, bunker busters? 
And of course, one of the thing, the important things was that the kind of Gandhian notion of nonviolence of, of being passive in the face of violence was not a form of nonviolence that was going to work for women because women were traditionally expected to be passive. We actually had to relearn nonviolence in such a way that we could be assertive and and reflect it back and not absorb it and not be passive and accepting in the face of violence, whether the violence was coming from the missiles, from the soldiers, from the police, and violence from the police really escalated over the years at Green, and it really did. persuaded that the um, Ministry of Defence and all the lawyers in the world who draw up these laws are draw up these laws which is interest. So Black, Black Cardigans is a code name, or was a code name for bolt cutters. And I'm going to come to a bit about language towards the end. So to understand how... Uh, oops, I think it might keep <coughs> dropping out, but I'm just going to leave it on that image for a while anyway. So I think it'll be OK. If it gets really annoying, shall I turn it off? I think it might be. I'll tell you what, I'll, um, I'm going to try just getting rid of this and seeing if that works. We've got some kind of glitch. Let's see if that works. Okay. okay. So to understand how artists and curators get closer to the object or moment of protest, we first need to understand some of the characteristics of direct action as a form of resistance both within uh, life and with art, within art and activism. So my teenage years were spent disrupting the American military operations in the UK, specifically the deployment of cruise missiles at USAF Greenham Common and on exercise on Salisbury Plain through Cruise Watch and later Nuke Watch. During this time, I learned the tactics of nonviolent direct action that have inspired a methodology of curatorial practice that I'm just starting to articulate some 30 years later. So when in the visual arts we talk about collapsing time and distance between objects, networks and events, I think of a mode of direct action which seeks to do the very same. A couple of years ago, I wrote a short catalogue essay for Power in the Land, which starts to challenge Deleuze's lines of flight away from the modern territory through Isabel Stenger's analysis of ideas within a longer time frame, which includes pre-modern thought, and the knowledge and power of women before the burning time, before the witch hunts, a time when women had agency. 
So rather than looking from modes of flight, I argued, many artists dealing with the nuclear are trying to zoom in, get closer, to get deeper into the territory, realising that there is no escape, the language or rhetoric of the nuclear can only be understood by getting closer and perhaps more embedded in the nuclear economy. What I didn't manage to expand on in my essay was the role of non-violent direct action as a way of getting closer to a site, a subject that remains pretty unexplored. Can we think of art or curating as a form of non-violent direct action? So today I want to introduce this concept of NVDA, non-violent direct action, as a form of performative and creative action which gets closer to the location and instruments of power and draw parallels with artistic and curatorial practices. I'll start with considering Howard, Howard Cagle's work on the philosophy of resistance and Anna Feynenbaum's more nuanced understanding of direct action at Greenham. Then I'll briefly consider the characteristics of nonviolent direct action within artistic practices. Then one day, not here, I will write a paper that fully weaves together the concepts of art and curating, which demonstrate or articulate the characteristics of NVDA to reconsider the agency of art. I've got a feeling that might be a book rather than an essay. It's kind of a big, big topic. So you might be, if you're following the protest series of lectures, you might already be reading Howard K. Gill's uh, uh, philosophy of resistance, on resistance. He maps two concepts of resistance. The first is resistance of, as a form of warfare, encapsulated by Clausewitz's de definition of the aims of war to render the enemy, enemy incapable of further resistance. So resistance is absolutely central to war. War addresses the enemy's capacity to resist. Here, resistance as war and resistance to war are part of the same armed struggle for power. While this might make sense from an activist or Marxist point of view in that the end game of capitalism uh, and the military industrial complex is war, so in a sense all activism is resistance to war, or all activist resistance is resistance to war. It also positions resistance as a military tactic rather than another way of thinking about conflict resolution or conflict transformation. And Cagle's second concept of resistance addresses resistant subjectivity based on notions of freedom. And here, the capacity to resist is resistance itself. He says, resistance is the fight for the enhancement of the capacity to resist. It is the actus of resistance, without hatred or desire for revenge, an affirmative resistance. Here, the energy, the active energy, actus of resistance, starts to take on a particular role within the peace movement, where the performance of resistance becomes the process of resisting. And perhaps this... Um, challenges some of the ideas around spectacle that were being discussed last week. So this is a valuable space to consider the agency of art as well as the agency of the activist, not simply as living an aesthetic life or a resistant life, but to go further in understanding the forms of nonviolent resistance, which lay the foundations for a practice of nonviolent direct action, inherited from Gandhi's Satagrapha and developed into a life practice, an effective tactic of the women's peace movement. So in this paper, I argue that the actus of nonviolent direct action creates a space for collective creative action which can change the paradigm of conflict and potentially of art. Anna Feynman, I can't really pronounce her name, Feynman's essay, From Cyborg Feminism to Drone Feminism, uh, published in 2015, discusses the importance of Donna Haraway's much misunderstood cyborg in the Cyber Feminist Manifesto. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this key text. So Feynman describes the origins of Haraway's text in relation to Greenham. And she gives a detailed and nuanced understanding of Greenham's tactics for material resistance, symbolic and actual, as cyborg feminists par excellence. And this was not a language that was used at Greenham. It's a language that's used retrospectively to reflect on um, the kind of uh, 
nature te technology relations of Greenham. And I, I think, think this um, analysis is very poignant. I've just read like 20 books about Greenham and I can't, I find that they're all really problematic, but I think Feynman has really understood what was going on. So Feynman's paper usefully situates contemporary drone feminism within a longer trajectory of cyborg feminism articulated through an analysis of the techno-strategic discourse of the Green and Peace camp. Here, the earth goddess spirituality of the camp is situated as a resistance, as a resistance entangled with the military operations and hardware of the base. Fain and Bob traces the materiality of the fence, the cr cruise convoy, the operations of the police, and the military industrial complex of the base. We might add to this list the whole nuclear missile convoy and its outriders and its exercises on Salisbury Plain. Feynman-Baum identifies the dislocation of cyborg theory from feminist anti-nuclear activisms in the 1980s and cites Haraway's reflection. So maybe what I should say here is that there's this dislocation is um, a kind of separation from uh, what was understood to be a kind of 1980s um, technology-resistant, nature-loving, uh, feminist uh, discourse of, the, of a peace camp that was in opposition to uh, the technology of the military industrial complex and that this was eclipsed by uh, a cyber, femino cyber feminist discourse that had a very different relationship to technology. And what Feynman is doing is bringing these two things together and saying there never was a separation, that, these, that the, the relationship between uh, nature and technology should be read together. So she cites Haraway's reflection on this split. She says, and Haraway says, what I was trying to do in the cyborg piece around the question of nature technology is locate myself and us in the belly of the monster in a techno-strategic discourse within a heavily militarized technology. This attempt to get closer to the subject, to be located quite literally in the belly of the monster, is one of the key characteristics of direct action. Feynman-Baum continues that feminist cyborg theory offers a way of understanding not only how political subjectivities are transformed through the production of language, but also how language practices are intimately bound up with ways in which we relate to technological objects and to the technological environment in which we live. And this lived experience of the nuclear economy is something that I'm um, quite preoccupied with as a, as a curator. So again, this care of language and subjectivity is found in the principles of direct action and how material entanglements are performed within the messy yet tactical slippage of nature and technology. Feynman-Baum tells us, in her manifesto, Haraway specifically identified Greenham Common Women's analysis of the military-industrial complex, establishment of non-hierarchical communications infrastructures and their tactical methods for intervening in the storage and transportation of cruise missiles. Haraway described how cruise missiles were more effectively blocked by the creative resistant practices of green and women than by the militant labor of old masculinist politics. Rather than rely solely on marches and petitions, green and women put their bodies in the way of the military infrastructure. They put locks on military entrance gates, had sit-ins in the road, damaged military property with colorful graffiti, and engaged in on-site performances that continually drew media attention to the presence of these missiles on British soil. Here, Haraway notes how green and women use symbolism and metaphor in place of conventional masculine politi political discourse to interfere with the operations of military power. Through embodied, collective, material semiotic practices, green and women constituted part of what Har Haraway saw as an emergent feminist cyber politics, cyborg politics. So when I read this, I think that the, it's the subjectivities and tactical methods and the production of language and the articulation of the complexity of the nature technology discourse is all kind of um, tested and articulated through the practice of nonviolent direct action. 
a practice that is strategic in its vision for transforming the discourse and culture, but tactical in its mode of operation. And my students know I'm always going on about strategy and tactics in this, this debate. So now I'm going to think about what non-violent direct action actually is. So uh, this is really how I understand it with a few references to other things that should become clear. So non-violent direct action is the transformation of power relations through a performative action at a site that embodies or enacts violence. The action aims to prevent that violence from taking place or to subvert or transform the violence in, some, in such a way that it is rendered ineffective. NVDA is a tactic that reveals or disrupts the institutional enactment of abuses of power. It is initially targeted at the bureaucratic, material, technological enforcement of violence rather than the violent act itself. So it's not about saying, you know, how do you respond when someone hits you over the head with a hammer? It's about how, what the social relations of the hammer are in, relation, you know, in, in any given situation. I've lost my thread now. So, yeah, so non-violent direct actions could be the blockade of an arms fair, the crashing of a server, the tracking of a nuclear warhead convoy, it could be preventing the border agency from removing a family from their home at dawn, it could be the release of data about public surveillance, refusing to cooperate with laws based on prejudice, race, class or gender. And then this is where the kind of complexity of uh, what constitutes direct action and what constitutes um, civil disobedience or other forms of action comes into play. And perhaps I can answer questions about that later if you're, if you're interested. But for now, I'm going to concentrate on this understanding of uh, the particular characteristics of nonviolent direct action. It's directness, it's nonviolence, and it's concept of action. So nonviolence, as we um, heard in the film from Helen John, is a particularly useful tactic when the power or force uh, is of a, when the yeah when the power or force is of a scale so large and so abstract and powerful that any small gestures of violence will simply give legitimacy to the surveillance and incarceration of the activists. You know, if you try and go and blow up the White House, you'll just be locked up forever. You know, there's no there's no kind of um, uh, sort of violent act of, uh, or expression that can deal with you know, large scale and distributed power. <coughs> so instead of using violence to fight violence resulting in mutually assured destruction, uh, MAD, or mutually assured injury uh, at best, uh, non-violence takes a more considered turn. But as Gandhi taught us, non-violence is also a lived experience a way of being, and in this sense, nonviolence is social, networked, and relational, and it takes time. Nonviolence includes a lived approach to, to, an assemblages, to assemblages of objects, landscapes, and people. In this way, the consequences of violence against one actor in the network is felt by the others. Deconstruction of violence takes place respect respectfully, directly, and creatively. The mode of deconstruction aims to tran transform the language of violence itself. So that's thinking about uh, what constitutes non-violence within this action. So what about directness? How is it direct? So it works to reveal the power relation at a site that otherwise attempts to present itself as normalized or banal. This can be an object in a landscape that enacts a power relation, such as a fence, a barrier, uh, a surveillance camera, or a monument, or machinery, such as diggers, military vehicles, or artifacts, such as weapons, or symbols, such as a poppy. It can be digitally located on a computer server, or the algorithm of a drone, or in the building inhabited by an institution. Nonviolent direct activists look for the sites and mechanisms through which abstract power is enacted and seek to transform them aesthetically and politically. The distance between institutions, organisations and the impact of their violence is collapsed through located obstruction, 
witnessing and public attention. This requires informed knowledge of the performance of power, its symbolic and rhetorical language, and what we might call an aesthetics of power. Now, I haven't drawn on Foucault here, but you, you can see where that comes from. NVDA is proactive, so thinking about the act action and the active and what's different to resistance. So resistance might be um, kind of, uh, um, what's the word? reactive to a power, whereas uh, non-violent direct action is always proactive. It seeks out the invisible or banal operations of power and renders them visible. If we identify strategy as power and tactics as the resistance to it, then strategy is located at the site of the institution and NVDA goes to that site. The practice doesn't wait for that power to be instrumentalised as violence. In this sense, non-violent direct action is preemptive, to borrow some military language. If the action takes place away from the site where power is enacted, then the action is not really direct. It becomes an indirect action of sorts, and the correlation between cause and effect of protest is harder to, harder to make. And I think Morgan Quaintance mentioned the Occupy movement and the problem with the Occupy movement not having a kind of clear focus. But we have to remember that the Occupy camp was first set up outside the Bank of England as a direct action protest next to and in the face of capital so that the, the bankers in the Bank of England would have to trip over all of those hundreds of people every day. But the camp was moved to the square in front of St Paul's Cathedral and the direct action aspect of that protest was rendered kind of ineffective. It became too easy for the government and the media to claim a lack of directness in the action. So thinking about action as performance, the action of nonviolent direct action is always performative in that it's both symbolic and actually present. The action involves human presence and duration in often theatrical forms of social transformation. It involves certain staged bodily gestures, movements, clicks, and modes of behaviour that enact or transform a site or set of relations. The action can include reclaiming or repurposing objects, materials, or landscapes. Symbolic and actual transformation and and this can be a symbolic and an actual transformation of power, in that power is mostly symbolic, but actually felt. Performative tactics often include Buckton's carnivalesque trickery, uh, also uh, articulated through Haraway, and within De Certo's notion of the everyday, using playful wit and humour, and a kind of appropriation of places, objects, tools and behaviours. Nonviolent direct action is also nonviolent in that it actively practices the care of nonviolence in all aspects of the action. It requires training and is supported by affinity groups. The affinity group will ensure that you know everyone you're taking part in the action with, that you have legal information, that the contact for legal support is, is written in pen on your arm, that your kids will be collected from school, that your car will be moved so you don't get a parking ticket, and that clean clothes and a toothbrush will be dropped off at the police station for you later. The affinity group ensures a shared experience and follow-up support. So why is this important for thinking about art and curating? <coughs> So what, there are many kind of conceptual frameworks around, around nonviolent direct action that are of interest. Um, but the point about collapsing distance seems to be a very important technique, that things that are keep, kept in discrete locations or in distinctly different geopolitical spaces are brought together. Distance is no, no longer becomes a rationale for the displacement of responsibility. The die-in blockade, uh, which we see kind of uh, re-performed in any, every generation of activism, is a classic form of direct action that enacts the consequences of violence on human beings. The distance between the arms deal 
and the use of weapons is symbolically collapsed. Breaching the primitive fence, dancing on the silos, getting closer to the belly of the beast requires creative tactics. Whilst Feinbaum cites drone feminism through a series of recent women's non-violent direct actions against distributed and remote drone warfare, which of course has real consequences, there's also a provenance within NVDA and within an art practice. So I'd like to um, kind of bridge the historical gap here between uh, uh, Greenham in the 1980s and the more recent 2010s or 20 teens, whatever decade we're in, and think about um, different kinds of non-violent direct action practices, um, both within art and activism or art and activism. I think the, um, there's, a, there's a lot more work to be done here, particularly around drone feminism and the way in which um, women are responding to feminist war, uh, to drone warfare. So my strategy as a curator um, is perhaps following uh, ideas of NVDAs to work as closely with pos as possible with nuclear sites and organisations <laughs> to take artists to these sites and to host roundtable discussions between the nuclear industry, its stakeholders and artists and curators and arts organisations. This process influences the language of all participants and is enabling artists and um, curators to contribute to the nuclear humanities discourse around uh, the nuclear economy. So in this way, my work is perhaps a sort of armchair academic form of non-violent direct action, leading to citing artworks within nuclear sites. But there are many different kinds of tactics that artists have developed for making work within the industry, um, not just through uh, working with me, but um, their own kind of um, existing practices. So I wanted to show you this uh, film by Kate Takeuchi, and I'll just see if I can get it up and running. I love the way my cat just keeps flashing. So this is um, this is a webcam, so it's very all my film material is very low grade. And this is probably what. Oh God, sorry, got adverts. <laughs> Here we go. So I'll let you watch this a little bit. So you might recognise, is, is anyone familiar with this film? You might recognise the site, it is the Fukushima Daiichi number one power plant on the east coast of Japan. And this footage is from a TEPCO webcam. TEPCO had a number of um, webcams around the Fukushima site anyway before the accident happened. And so the accident was effectively streamed live through their, through their own webcams online. You have to be particularly interested in TEPCO and nuclear power stations to be watching this webcam in case an accident <laughs> happens. But uh, the existing footage is there. And I think Philippe de Roy, who's an artist, has made work with, with that actual live footage of the, um, live recorded footage of the power plant melting down through TEPCO's own webcam infrastructure. So this uh, finger pointing worker is represented by an artist called Kota Takeuchi who has made a series of works that are embedded in the uh, Fukushima power plant site itself and the exclusion zones around the plant. This work is called Pointing at Fukushima, Fuki, Fukiuchi Live Cam. 
in 2011. And it draws on Vito Conchi's uh, film, which you uh, might recognise, where Vito Conchi is pointing directly at the camera. So the, the pointing of the hand obscures the face and the finger becomes like an extension of the nose in this quite clownic uh, theatrical uh, image. When you see the close-up of the face, you can see this. And here the, the viewer and the performer are kind of trapped in this loop of image capture. So uh, the worker here has a, has a mobile phone in his hand on which he's watching the webcam live footage of himself pointing at the camera. So, and I'll show you a drawing of that in a moment. So the work performs the relationship between the technologies of surveillance and the transparency of public information and place. Here the action is direct, it's on site, it's using the corporate webcam designed for public information. How we get out of this. Here we are. So this is the, the drawing that demonstrates the, the loop between the performer, the mobile, the TEPCO server, and the people watching it, or the eyes. <laughs> I love the little eyes. Uh, watching this image um, as it kind of circulates through the network uh, before coming back. It's obviously, it's much more distributed than this. It's not a pure loop, but it's a nice, uh, nice visualisation of the idea of the loop of image capture, where the distance between the performer, the viewer, and the, um, the company of Tepco is all brought together in one kind of complicit act of self-viewing. The worker points as if to point kind of responsibility both at TEPCO, at you, and at himself. So this kind of complicit, this loop of complicity is um, really, I think, interestingly articulated through this work. So non-violent direct action is um, obviously not just uh, the province of, of Green and Common. It's something that is a strategy or a form of activism that is carried out by many different art activist groups. And I'm just going to whistle through some of them, some very familiar and some not. So you might be familiar with the Art Not Oil campaign, they're very beautifully um, performed and photographed uh, expressions of nonviolent direct action are at a site where the corporate interests are banally flaunted to enable oil companies a social license to operate. And the national arts institutions fulfil their uh, national portfolio role from the Arts Council of England, uh, which requires them to um, have public-private finance partnerships as part of their funding portfolio. So here, oil was brought into contact with the Tate and the bodies of the performers themselves. So this kind of collapsed distance between the material of oil, and of course not really oil, it's molasses, which relates to the role of the Tate and its own colonial um, history and um, being built on, on empire. But I, I see this um, as directly coming out of a uh, uh, trajectory of nonviolent direct action at Greenham. Another form of tactical media, and this is another kind of category of our activist practice, um, that perhaps has informed the drone feminist practices, is uh, something like Floodnet in the 1990s. Uh, the electronic, dis uh, electronic civil disobedience is a form of tactical media that employs creative online tactics to create direct actions within media tools and systems. Famously, the Zapatista movement used Floodnet in a mass action in 1998. The names of the Zapatista farmers killed by the American 
American, sorry, killed by the Mexican army in military attacks on the autonomous village of El Bosque were used in the construction of bad URLs to upload their names onto a server. So two things happened here. The names of the dead were uploaded onto the server and the process of, of doing that um, kind of crashed the server and made the, the, the um, public function of the server useless. So Brett Stahlbaum writes about the, uh, the Floodnet action, the Zapatista Floodnet action. He says, in an artistic sense, this is a way of remembering and honouring those who gave their lives in defence of their freedom. In a conceptual sense, the Floodnet performance was able to facilitate a symbolic return of the dead to the servers of those responsible for their murders. So this um, collapsing distance between the military and the names of the dead is something that occurs um, a lot in online activism. Uh, in a similar vein, Joseph de Lapp's Roll Call of the Dead of Iraq within the online multiplayer game America's Army uh, juxtaposed the use of the game as a recruitment tool with the real death toll of the conflict. And we see this um, kind of reenacting the tools of uh, recruitment or um, technologies of war for, uh, to create a different kind of space and different kind of language. So there's another kind of form of um, uh, prop, if you like, of nonviolent direct action. Now, I actually find this a really violent image, and I intentionally put the name of the artist performing the image here on the credit, because she is a performance artist and she's performing this um, as an artwork, as part of Zach Blass's Face Cages artwork. Just to think about... Um, the, the object here, just thinking about art as art objects as props for nonviolent direct action. So these um, um, masks uh, prevent facial recognition software from tracking individuals, and it's a similar technique as was used by Jane and Louise Wilson in their false positives, false negatives artwork, um, which was part of a film made by forensic architecture, in fact. So this, um, both of these works, both the kind of strip face painting and the, uh, the metal mask, one being more disfiguring uh, than, than the other, perhaps, they both interrupt facial recognition software. So the, the biometrics of measuring between your eyebrow and your cheekbone to your nose to your chin are disrupted and interrupted. They are interfered with through uh, this kind of painted faces or modify, modified faces which disorientate the machine. It's beautifully called dazzle camouflage. So dazzle camouflage artworks are propositions for direct action Theatrical props for an intervention into the control of individual rights and movement. So these artworks um, are a kind of a kind of dress rehearsal props for nonviolent direct action, which take us back to the idea of the feminist cyborg, thinking technology and nature together to find ways of techno strategic resistance in the belly of the beast. And thinking about landscape, I want to tell you about this mountain. And we're going to sing you a song. <laughs> and this mountain is, um, the this is the Grampian Mountains in Scotland, just north of Glasgow. And lying at the bottom of these mountains is the Faslane um, Trident Submarine Base. And this photograph was, um, I took this photograph in 2013, and this is where Britain's current nuclear weapons are based. And they're on submarines in this, uh, in this lock. There's an artist residency centre just above the lock, so if you're interested, I recommend going to Cove Park and um, trying to... Uh, have a look at the, the different kind of military technologies that are um, surround this 
landscape. This is my characteristic of non-violent direct action. <coughs> Don't kill a spirit. She is like a mountain, old and strong. She goes on and on and on. You can't kill a spirit. She is like a mountain, old and strong. She goes on and on and on. You can't kill a spirit. She is like a mountain, old and strong. She goes on and on and on. You can't kill a spirit. She is like a mountain, old and strong. She goes on and on and on. You can't kill a spirit. She is like a mountain, old and strong. She goes on and on and on. So the song that we just sang is one of many uh, songs sung at Greenham, and um, one of the, I guess, uh, song had a number of different functions at the camp, and one of the um, really explicit ways of how song collapsed distance would be when women were arrested and taken to what was called Newbury Nick the, the um, police station in Newbury and locked in cells. And women from the camp would go and be outside the police station and sing other songs, but often this song, because it was the easiest one to remember, the easiest one for everyone to sing. And so the women who were locked up in the police cells could hear the other women in the other cells singing, and they could hear the women outside singing to them. So the, the separation and the isolation of the prison architecture, both of the police station and actually of Holloway Prison, because uh, hundreds of women were sent to prison for weeks or months at a time. Um, so song was used to kind of connect through these architectures and through these um, practices of isolation and kind of punishment to kind of render them pointless, really. And... Um, I think Helen John said in the film that the laws that upheld the, um, the nuclear state she uh, seen, saw as illegal. So there was no sense that women who were going to prison, that they didn't feel they had, ever, they had done anything wrong. So they were very empowered, and mm. song was um, a really mm. important way of forming that connection. Mm. Um. Because I, I suppose with song, you were also talking about uh, creative practices, creative actions um, that the groups would take. Um, and and I, w I was trying to think about this in relation to a distinction that you made that I'm hoping you can unpack a little bit about um, between protest and action. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so partly I was thinking, you know, if you um, I would think like the um, if, if anyone goes on a protest, you know, you, you, you join in. Uh, vocally, you know, your, you know, the march, the idea of kind of um, bodies moving in a particular rhythm, or, or, or not, you know, kind of um, breaking up the the, the four four. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about that in terms of like collective protest, but also, um, do you, do you see uh, this as a form of, of action then? This 
um, uh, the, the, the boy sing the song, mm. um, but also if you could unpick that distinction that you made. I guess song is a form of direct action if it's tied to an event and it's tied to a site. Okay. So and it's tied to the um, transformation of power. So the, the the march, the demonstration walking down the street in London with placards is taking place on a permissible route, on permissible space. Yeah. There's no there's no kind of challenge to any legal infrastructure or to um, I mean other than the police which if you want to take on the police as the kind of authority, mm. then that's one thing. But um, it's, it's um, what did I call it? It's an indirect action. Okay. It's not a direct action. It's, it's very important to um, have bodies on the streets. It's very important to occupy public space and use public space, what it was designed for, mm. <laughs> what kind of perhaps originally, originally was, if we think about common space, to enact our rights to walk, to be in public, is, is really important, particularly when those rights are clamped down on. Um, it is illegal in Britain for more than three or four people to gather on a street corner. You can be arrested. <laughs> Usually you're not. <laughs> but if they want to, they can. So, in fact, our public space is heavily regulated and controlled, even though we don't always have a sense of it. Mm. Uh, we have a sense of it in that you can't sit down anywhere without having to buy a cup of coffee, mm. um, uh, but you're not going to be arrested for that. You're just going to be ripped off some money <laughs> for a cup of coffee that you don't really want <laughs> just because you want to sit down, but that's a different thing. Um, so, so I think that, that there is a distinction between a kind of permissible protest, mm -hmm. which is... Um, a kind of performance really for, for the media and a direct action which is, um, can be documented by the media but isn't for the media, it's for the instrument of power that is taking place in that site, it's to transform that with the people that are there and you know then in that place and that's primarily the point of the action. So it doesn't really matter if you're documented or not documented. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's really bad archives of Greenham. Bear in mind this is pre-internet time, mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons, but the other is that um, it wasn't constructed as a performance of spectacle for media. You know, that, that relates a little bit to what we were talking about last week, and maybe you can help us with, with some of that before I open it up to questions, so bear in mind your questions. But, um, one of the things that came up was the idea of intervening into the spectacle. Um, and actually, I think there was almost the same image that was, was being introduced at the, the Tate. Um, and as I recall, there was a, a kind of, um, uh, not an argument being made, but you know, there, there was a kind of general um, sense coming from uh, the talk that this was, uh, I don't know, perhaps a bit um, easy or something. I don't know if that's the right, right term for it. But, um, and then we had the discussion around the complexity of image and art making an image. But um, could, could you talk a little bit about that particular image mm -hmm. and how it relates to this idea, if it does, mm -hmm. about um, being located or being related to site and this transformation of power? Like, do you mm -hmm. see that action mm -hmm. as a kind of direct or mm -hmm. nonviolent direct action? Um, yeah, I do understand it as a nonviolent direct action. I think that particular image, this is the image of the woman lying on the floor having molasses being pulled over her, um, is it's just one image of a whole performance. But it's, it's the most provocative image that is picked up by the media and operates as a spectacle. But if you look at all of the different uh, protests of Art Not Oil, there are hundreds and hundreds of people that are taking part. Um, they're large um, collective actions. They uh, transform the, the architecture and the acoustics and the space of the Tate mm -hmm. into, some, into a different kind of place. They insert a, an artwork or a performance that deals with the, the politics of the funding structure of the Tate and its sponsorship by BP and its historical legacy, mm -hmm. you know, all, it, all in one place. So it collapses the, the kind of remoteness of the board, or the chair of the board, who is now uh, resigned, which is, or not resigned, but come to the end of his tenure, which is why 
uh, the Tate can now uh, let go of its BP sponsorship mm -hmm. because the chair of the Tate board used to be, the former chair of the Tate board used to be the former chair of BP. So, mm -hmm. you know, all of these kind of power relations that are quite hidden and sort of confused and complicated and distant mm -hmm. become enacted and performed uh, in, this, in this event. In, in the site of the of in, in the site of the Tate, yeah, that work can, can't happen somewhere else. It has to happen there. Um, are, are there questions? Can we open it up? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I don't have a watch. I've no well, idea. I just wondered if you could expand the term drone feminism, please. The, the term, sorry. Drone the term drone, drone, drone feminism. feminism. Yeah. So it's really um, Anna Fagenbaum's term to describe um, kind of more contemporary uh, activist practices, feminist activist practices, uh, looking at drone warfare. So um, obviously the nuclear uh, weapons program still exists and <laughs> is very much there, but it's not a kind of current focus of um, feminist protest. There's still lots going on, but it doesn't have a, a kind of public profile in the way that it used to, which is, you know, a huge <laughs> debate about the construction of fear around the weapons program. But that's not answering your question. So the but the drone uh, drone feminism is um, yeah a kind of umbrella term to describe 2010 onwards practices. Um, <coughs> trying to um, intercept or draw attention to the infrastructure of drone warfare. So the server sites, the um, uh, military bases, um, and, its, and its operations. So legally, within the law, and also uh, at those specific sites, trying to disrupt drone operations. So to, just to answer your last question, I think it can be both. So Black Lives Matter can be, you know, is a broad campaign and can employ a number of different strategies mm -hmm. from spectacle to direct action and protest and everything in between. Um, but to uh, talk about white feminism is, is really important here, yeah. And um, I think Anna Fagenbaum's article, which I really recommend reading, draws, draws this out very clearly. Um, and she actually positions uh, uh, Haraway's um, cyber feminist manifesto and the idea of the cyborg as drawing on uh, black literature, science fiction, um, other cultural forms, not be, and not being such a kind of white feminist defined uh, concept. So I think that's that's really important to to point out. Uh, so Greenham was predominantly a kind of local action um, when it first started. Women came from Wales and marched to um, the peace camp. They, they marched to the, uh, the base, the military base, and then set up the camp. And then the, I mean, the women that I met there came from all over the world and from all different cultures and backgrounds, uh, racial and class backgrounds. So it was a very broad 
campaign, but in a kind of, not quite home counties, but in a, you know, little village in Berkshire, it was essentially, um, you know, Newbury is, uh, was then essentially a very white town. So um, there are a lot of complexities around the camp to do with class and race. race. And I think that they're addressed very well by um, the idea of the uh, uh, idea of cyborg feminism, which is much more complex and mm. culturally complex. Okay. 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 Um, you can. I was just wondering about this, uh, when you say that the media is not the primary interest in these forms of action. Um, do you think that sometimes maybe it might be dismissed by people there, even though you call it a certain attribute, like obviously being there, not you know, destabilizing their kind of day to day routine of these people? But um, if the media didn't intervene in some way, or if it didn't mm. become a public um, yeah, yeah, mm. form of discussion or uh, attention to that matter, mm. do you think maybe it could just be dismissed if, if no one knew about it? Yeah. Just people there. <laughs> Yes, of course. I mean, it's, it's kind of blindingly <laughs> obvious. If you don't have any um, public profile or publicity, if people have no way of finding out then uh, about what's going on, then, then you will have no visibility. And making visible requires the media, in some sense, to make visible. But there's just thinking particularly about Greenham and perhaps other sites like Blockading an Arms Fair, there are hundreds and hundreds of people taking part in that process, mm, mm. you know. So if you're if you're doing an action in in the House of Commons or in Buckingham Palace, you know there are thousands of people walking by. There's already a staged scenario in which your event is taking place. So it's not that the media doesn't matter. It's and it doesn't matter in the wider campaign. But often, um, I think we. I mean, now we live in a you know, mobile phone photographed, we kind of document everything we do, including our breakfast, um, weirdly. Um, but, so our whole lives are staged for the camera already. <laughs> so it's quite difficult to unthink that to a time where um, actions could be staged for the site and the place and the people mm. that were in them primarily, and then could be documented. So it wasn't staged for the documentation of itself, perhaps. But you know, if you look up the Google yeah. women dancing on silos, you'll see um, women dancing on the silos, which were mm. the bunkers where the cruise missiles were kept. And that, that image went viral yeah. and is really powerful and captures Greenham. So and it's, it went viral in the media, yeah. Good question. Hi. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if you guys are interviewed by anyone on the, like, you know, the Black Party dance, you talked about the news, some of that kind of language. Yeah. So, um, two things happened with bolt cutters. So, bolt cutters were used to cut the fence and, and get into the base. And, um, the, the police would confiscate them, and if they heard anyone mention bolt cutters, they would be there to try and stop women breaking into the base. So we needed a code word for bolt cutters, and the code word was oddly black cardigans. Now, I'm now at a time in my life where I quite often wear a black cardigan, <laughs> but I can quite honestly say I don't think anyone at Greenham ever wore a black cardigan. You know, it was a real sort of twin set and pearls idea of dress. <laughs> so it was a bit of a joke. <laughs> but the black cardigan was the bolt cutters. Mm -hmm. So very quickly, um, so in Newbury, there are a number of hardware shops where you could buy bolt cutters, but they refused to sell them to women. So men who visited the camp would often say, oh, is there anything I can do to help? including Jeremy Corbyn, who came one day and said, is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> and uh, Rebecca said to him, yes, you can uh, go and buy some bolt cutters because <laughs> women aren't allowed to buy bolt cutters in Newbury. So uh, she gave him some money and off he went and bought some bolt cutters and brought them back. And funnily enough, later that night, there are a lot of women dancing on the silo. <laughs> so um, another kind of form of... Uh, 
Activism is to develop a, a secret or a hidden language. Mm. Mm. And I didn't talk about that, and you're right to, to bring it up. Um, Crypting. I was at the, yeah, yeah, yeah. A kind of encrypted language mm. or mm. a hidden language. And um, I'm going to get my notes on this so I get it exactly right. There was an artist who was presented as part of the Serpentine Marathon um, a few weeks ago. And um, I was trying to look up information about her on the Serpentine website, and there is nothing. There's no recording of her recording that was played. There's no mention of her practice. There's a biog of her, but it just lists kind of prizes. It doesn't say anything about her work. But she's called Gala Porus Kim. And she's, I think, based in Los Angeles. And she's a super interesting artist. And her recording that she made for the Serpentine Marathon was of whistle language. And a whistle language developed by the Oaxaca to communicate without being understood by mm. their, by the colonizers. Mm. And this language is being taught in schools. That's and it's amazing, it's so beautiful. Um, and she describes this as a hidden transcript in the art of resistance. Mm. And there's a, a book by James C. Scott on hidden transcripts in the art of resistance, where he looks at different forms of language that are developed as resistance. That's fascinating. So that's, that's a great yeah. question. Are, are there other questions? Oh, thank you. Well, the, the camp became women only fairly quickly after it was established. And um, I mean, of course, everyone's families, partners, fathers, brothers uh, supported, not always supported, but mostly supported them to be at the camp. So um, uh, yeah, men were kind of involved in helping but they didn't play a, a kind of focal role. Men could visit for the day, um, and there were a number of different camps around the base, so it kind of depended which camp you went to. Some of the camps were more separatist, women only, and others would welcome men as visitors for the day mm. and have conversations. So often there were male journalists that would come and interview people. So, yeah, that was just you know, part of everyday life. But, the, but men couldn't stay overnight and the, couldn't take part in actions, in the actual protests and blockades. And if you watch the film, the first film that we watched earlier on, um, and I think uh, Rebecca in the film says that the police violence really escalated over the 10 years of the camp. Um, I think it's not the, the kind of prop, the gender issues a t twofold. One would be um, the actual protest itself would be completely different and trans transformed if it had been a mixed protest, but also the attitude of the police and the soldiers to the protest would have been totally different. And I think the whole thing would have collapsed pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So the kind of resilience of uh, women's power as ex asymmetrical to the military industrial mm -hmm. complex and the um, uh, legal and political structures mm. uh, at the time, um, which were even more male than they are now, um, is, is, re is really important, was really important. Do you think that at a time, like back in those days, um, the police would not have been either be a woman? Because nowadays, I don't know, I was watching about uh, Spain and Catalonia, what's going on right now, and they're beating women. Um, gender doesn't, that's complete equality in that sense. Uh, 
I think the police have become militarised. Yeah. Yeah. So at the beginning, no, I think I think you're right. The, so at the beginning, the police were sort of, oh, I'm terribly sorry. You know, <laughs> so would, you, would you mind terribly just moving over there, please? You know, and you say, oh, well, very nice of you to ask, sir, but actually, no, I'm going to stay here. <laughs> oh, right. Mm. And so the policeman would go off and talk to his superior and they'd huddle together and have a chat about it and they'd come over and say... OK, right, well, you can stay there for about um, 20 minutes and then you have to move and you'd say, OK, then, bye. And they'd go and 20 minutes later they'd come back and they'd say, your 20 minutes is up, you have to move. And you'd say, well, I'm terribly sorry, but actually this is a blockade yeah. and we, there's a nuclear weapons convoy tr- coming this way, so we really don't want it to, so we're going to stay here. And this would go on and on and on. So those were the early days. But, of course, um, this escalated pretty rapidly and the Americans were like we've got to go we've got to go on exercises it's going to happen and the exercises then moved to the middle of the night so this would all happen in the night and Cruise Watch uh, was a network of activists including men who monitored the um, the movement of the cruise missile convoy which would drive out this is a convoy of I'm not quite sure how many vehicles but like 20 or 30 were vehicles You've got the, the, the trucks with the weapons on, you've got the um, fire engines, police, the RAF, the police outriders, you've got the military, poli- you've got the Americans, you've got the British military, you've got the British military police, you've got the civilian police for each county that it drives through. It's a massive convoy, you can't miss the thing. Mm-hmm. And it drives through uh, from Berkshire into Wiltshire and would go on exercise. And they would try and hide in a wood somewhere. Um, with all these hundreds of people and lights and police and stuff. They try and hide and uh, try and put the back of the truck up to point the weapons at the sky like they were going to launch them. And then they'd put it down mm. and then the next day they'd drive back again. And that was basically what they were trying to do. Mm. Mm. And so this would be stopped by paying blockades, potatoes, misdirections, getting lost. They'd often drive the wrong way on the road because they're Americans, so they got confused about which way, which side of the road to drive on, particularly going around roundabouts, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was a bit crazy and quite dangerous, and people did get hurt, and um, yeah, so there was uh, perhaps thinking about gender and protest, Cruise Watch was important as a mix. Mostly because they needed a lot of people to fix the cars. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 I just looked back at my notes and realized I had a, a million more. So if you don't mind, I might just ask one more. And then, oh, yeah. does anybody else have a really pressing one they want to ask? Oh, you do. Wait, where? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's yours. Um, you mentioned like, the, the agency of witches. Um, mm. I thought that was nice. Uh, <laughs> um, do you know instances of, or do you think there's still a power in like non-industrial uh, medicinal practices in this kind of mm. non-violent direct action? Do, do you know of that? Or do you think it's still present? Mm. Do you think it's still a, a place of agency? very short answer is yes. <laughs> There's a very long answer. <laughs> uh, have we got time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, <sighs> how much do you know about witches? So, <laughs> how much does everyone know about witches? Um, Anna Collin, who is a curator, who's done a lot of work around uh, witches and uh, art particularly if you're interested in this uh, area. But to think of um, kind of women's knowledge and informal bodies of knowledge as having agency is really valuable. And, um, you know, women at Greenham didn't know anything about nuclear weapons, really, other than they didn't want them to be there. Um, You didn't have to be a nuclear physicist to argue against nuclear weapons. So... Um, I guess uh, the whole kind of process of taking 
uh, ownership and control over your own health and well-being, particularly reproductive rights. And if we think about uh, witches as not just herbalists but midwives and being very close to female health practices, which is very different from um, the uh, kind of male um, establishment of, of doctor health practices. Have you seen that program Quacks? It's kind of comedy about <laughs> Victorian doctors. It's brilliant. It really performs the kind of bravado of men enacting surgery and they just literally made it up as they went along, which is quite funny. And the, I guess the, the, the burning time, during the burning times and the witch hunts, two things happened. One is that um, women's medicinal knowledge, as you say, herbal medicinal knowledge, was kind of overruled and denigrated and it was something that you could be burnt for. And um, the enclosures happened. You know? So the enclosure of land, the implementation of property, the um, ownership of healthcare, all kind of interrelate. So um, you can read Sylvia Frederici and uh, Starhawk and Isabel Spengers mm -hmm. on these topics. So at Greenham, that same kind of um, critical historical analysis was being applied to the military industrial complex. And when I say the military industrial complex, that was a term coined to describe the nuclear economy hmm. uh, by Eisenhower. That's great. Well, I think I think we we need to end. That was really fascinating. I really really thank you. And can we just thank Ellen? For that?